Good afternoon. Let me welcome you to this the closing session of our monthly international governance lecture series for this academic year. I'm a great believer in starting things on the right note and in ending them with a bang rather than with a whimper. So I'm thus particularly delighted that this academic year we're closing this series with such a noted international relations theorist as we have today. By definition, in a PhD program in global governance, we sometimes show a certain institutionalist bias. But I think it would be fair to say that we are of a pluralist persuasion, and we are keen to be exposed to as many distinguished voices from the international relations field as possible. We're extremely fortunate to have with us today to close our program for this year, none other than Professor John Mersheimer, the Wendell Harrison Distinguished Prof Service Professor at the University of Chicago and the co-director of the Program on International Security Policy there, and one of the most established representatives of the realist school of thought in international relations. Professor Mayor Simon brings to his analysis of international affairs a very special perspective as a West Point graduate and as someone who served uh, both in the US Army and the US Air Force. He knows only too well the realities of hard power and the imperatives of war, as some of you discovered in our over lunch discussion. Um, a frequent contributor to the leading journals in international security, international security. Professor Mirsham is the author of five books, including Conventional Deterrence and The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, books which have won a number of awards. He is best known, though, for his book co-authored with Stephen Walt, The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy, a book that made the New York Times bestseller list and has been translated into 19 languages. It is thus not just intellectual rigor and a fierce commitment to the full understanding of what happens in international politics that characterizes Professor Mayor Simon's work, but also an unwillingness to stay away from highly controversial topics, veritable academic minefields where not many political scientists dare to thread. The latest subject he has taken on and on which he has kindly shared with us a preliminary version of a few chapters of his forthcoming book to be published by Oxford University Press is provocatively entitled, Why Leaders Lie, Lying in International Politics. This is, you might say, not exactly a conventional subject to find in IR syllabi, yet one that is rather important. With so much strategizing and positioning for advantage that takes place in foreign policy and in diplomacy, the question of lying, how much of it takes place, what role it plays in negotiations and so on is obviously very significant. Yet until now, it had not been taken on as directly and as straightforwardly as Professor Mayer Simon has. I, for one, have therefore great curiosity as to what his findings on this subject have been. Without further ado, I leave with you Professor Mayer Simon. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here at CIGI. I'd like to thank York very much for inviting me to speak and for all of you to coming out and to listen to what I have to say. As you know, I wrote this book uh, on why leaders lie. And I thought I'd start by telling you how I got interested in the subject. I got a phone call in the spring of 2003 from a man named Serge Schmemann, who then wrote for the New York Times, and he said that he was writing a piece for the Week in Review section on lying in international politics. And he said, for some reason, my name popped into his head, <laughs> and he decided to call me. Now, I had never spoken to him before, uh, and I, I knew his name, but I didn't know him. So he started by saying, what do you know about lying in international politics? And I thought for a second, and I said, I've never thought about the subject. And I said, as I'm racing through my brain here, I can't think of anything that's been written on the subject. So I said, why don't you tell me what you're thinking about the subject, and then I'll uh, react to what you have to say. So we talked for about an hour, had a very fruitful conversation, and then I wrote a memo for the record afterwards uh, 
Then a few months later, I got a call from MIT, and they asked me if I would come and give a talk. And I said, of course. Uh, and I said, what do you want me to talk about? And they said, anything you want. So I said, well, maybe I'll pull, back, pull out that memo from my files and talk about international lying, which is what I decided to do. And then I subsequently gave more talks, uh, talked to more people, wrote a paper, and then eventually the book that's coming out this fall. And that's what I want to tell you about today. Let me start by telling you that the key premise in my study is that lying sometimes makes good strategic sense. My argument is that lying is a useful tool of statecraft. It has political utility. Now, when I talk about lying, I'm not talking about selfish lies where people lie for their own personal benefit. I'm talking about what I would call strategic lies. This is where people lie because they think it is in the national interest. In effect, people are telling lies that they believe are noble lies, to use Plato's famous phrase. And just to give you an example of how this might work, uh, for purposes of settling the Cuban Missile Crisis, Nikita Khrushchev told President Kennedy uh, that he would pull the Soviet missiles out of Cuba, provided that Kennedy pulled the Jupiter missiles out of Turkey. We had nuclear-armed Jupiter missiles in Turkey. Now, Kennedy had actually wanted to get rid of those Jupiter missiles before the Cuban Missile Crisis. So he had no problem getting rid of those missiles. But he understood full well that the political costs, both at home and in Europe, especially with the Turks, would be very great if he was seen as having agreed to bring the Jupiters home in return for the Soviets bringing the missiles in Cuba home. He just couldn't cut that deal in public. So he told Castro, excuse me, he told uh, Khrushchev that um, he'd accept the deal, but Khrushchev could not tell anyone in a public forum about the deal, and if he did, Kennedy would deny it. Kennedy, of course, also understood that uh, people in the United States would smell that deal and ask questions about it. And of course they did. And what Kennedy then did was he lied. And we didn't know for many decades that the deal had actually been cut because the Kennedy administration, including President Kennedy himself, denied at point after point that there had been any deal on the Jupiter missiles. When in fact, of course, there had been a deal. This, in my opinion, was a noble lie. Kennedy was, in my opinion, smart to lie because it was very important to end the Cuban Missile Crisis and make sure we didn't end up in a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. As I go along here, I'll point out some other examples that I think are noble lies. But the point that I'm making to you here is that when leaders tell lies, right, although it is sometimes for selfish purposes, those are not the cases I'm interested in. I'm interested in the cases where leaders tell lies for what they think are good strategic reasons. They think that lying is in the national interest. Now, very important to define what I mean by lying, because you can have a rather loose definition of lying or you can have a rather tight definition of lying. And depending on which one you choose, that affects how you think about this tool of statecraft. I have a rather tight definition. For me, lying is where a leader says something that he or she knows is not true. Um, a good example of this is when Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld said on September 27, 2002, this is roughly six months before we launched the war against Saddam, which was of course in March 2003. He says on September 27, 2002, we have quote unquote bulletproof evidence of a link between Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. 
Of course, he did not have bulletproof evidence. And he said on October 4th, 2004, before the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City, to my knowledge, this is Rumsfeld speaking, to my knowledge, I have not seen any strong, hard evidence that links the two. Remember, he had said, we have bulletproof evidence. And here he is, a few years later, saying he had not seen any such evidence. That's one kind of lie. Lying also occurs when leaders say a number of truthful things for the purpose of leading someone to a false conclusion. In other words, they hint at this false conclusion. They don't explicitly lie the way they do in the first sense. Let me give you an example of this. Many Americans believed before the war against Iraq and certainly after the war against Iraq that Saddam was involved in the events of 9-11. This is the idea that Saddam helped contribute to what happened on September 11th. Now, the Bush administration never said explicitly that Saddam was responsible for 9-11. But I could give you a list of probably about 20 comments by the president, the vice president, and some of their lieutenants where they clearly hinted that Saddam was responsible in part for the events of 9-11. And of course, as you all know, this was very important in getting the American people to back the war against Iraq. So this is a case where leaders are not explicitly saying that something is true when it's not. This is where they're making a number of elliptical statements, right? Not explicit lies that are designed to give people a false impression of what actually happened. That to me is a second form of lying. Now, what are the other forms of deception that exist besides lying? It's important to understand that deception can take three forms. First kind is lying. The second is concealment. Concealment is where leaders simply say nothing about a particular issue. Good example, again, having to do with Iraq. In the run-up to the war, the Bush administration concealed from the American people the fact that we had had two instances where prominent, al excuse me, prominent Al-Qaeda leaders, Sheikh, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Abu Zubaydah, told us independently that there was no link between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. In other words, these two al-Qaeda leaders told us there was no link. The Bush administration did not lie to the American people about that. What the Bush administration did was conceal the results of those two interviews from the American people. That's concealment. Concealment is different than lying. Third kind of deception, which you know all about because you engage in it in your everyday life, is what I would call spinning. This is where you tell favorable stories about yourself. If you go to a bar and you meet a young man or a young woman who you find attractive, you don't tell that person all of the dirt about yourself. You instead tell a very positive story. You spin it in the most positive way. You emphasize the good and de-emphasize or maybe conceal the bad. Uh, you exaggerate, you distort. It's what flirting, of course, is all about. That's spinning, right? That's not lying. If President Obama is to talk to the American people tonight about how the war is going in Afghanistan or in Iraq, he will put the most positive spin on his talk. He will emphasize the good and de-emphasize the bad. That's part of the warp and woof of daily life in international politics. But that's spinning. And spinning is different than lying. We would all be shocked if President Bush told a lie in his talk 
about Afghanistan or his talk about Iraq tonight. It's not to say he wouldn't do it under any circumstances, because again, my point is that he might very well lie, right? But lying is different than spinning. So when you talk about deception, there are three forms of deception. Lying, concealment, and spinning. And I would contrast deception with truth-telling or truthfulness. Truth-telling is where an individual goes to great lengths to tell what he or she thinks the facts of a story are as accurately as possible. As you all know, being good social scientists, there's no way that any one individual can know all the facts and not have some biases affect his or her view of the world. This happens. But the point is, if you are a truthful individual or you're behaving in a truthful way in a particular circumstance, you go to great lengths to tell the story as completely and as accurately as possible. So I would contrast truth-telling with deception. And again, the three forms of deception are lying, concealment, and spinning. Just to drive this point home one more time, let's talk about what happens in a courtroom. In a courtroom, at least in the United States, you have a lawyer and a prosecutor. When the lawyer and the prosecutor go before the jury and make their opening statement and make their closing statement, they spin. If you're the defense lawyer, you spin a story that portrays your client in the best possible light. If you're the prosecutor, you spin the story about the defendant in the most negative light, both in the opening statement and in the closing statement. It's taken for granted in the American legal system that lawyers and prosecutors spin. They're expected to spin. However, if you are a witness in that courtroom and you get up on the stand, you are asked to swear that you will tell the whole truth and nothing but the whole truth. And you are expected to answer those questions that are posed to you truthfully. You're not expected to spin. You're certainly not expected to conceal. You're expected to tell the truth. That's truth telling. And I contrast that with spinning. And of course, the lawyer who is defending the person under prosecution and the prosecutor may both engage in concealment. So again, you can see we're in a courtroom. You have concealment, spinning, truth telling, and where lying is not allowed. In other words, if you're the defense attorney or you're the prosecutor, you're not allowed to lie. And you're certainly not allowed to lie if you're a witness. That's called perjury. Right, so lying is unacceptable. Spinning is acceptable. Truth-telling is acceptable. And concealment is acceptable. All this gets at the fact that there's something about lying that makes it special. And to put it in very simple terms, it's kind of an evil form of behavior. Nobody really likes being called a liar. It'd be a terrible thing to be called a liar. If you're accused of spinning, that's acceptable. But to be called a liar, there's something very disturbing about that. And that's why so few people call others liars, uh, unless they're really very angry at them. But of course, again, my argument is that lying happens in international politics. It is a useful tool of statecraft. Now, I believe there are five kinds of international lies. What I tried to do in my conversation with Serge Schmemann, and as I've worked my way through this subject, is think about the different kinds of lies that are told. And the first kind of lying is interstate lying. This is where the leaders in one state lie to a foreign audience. It can be the leaders in another state, the people in another state, or both. This is an interstate lie. It's lying between or among states. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples of that. Hitler, at the time of the Munich Agreement in the fall of 1938, said that now that he had the Sudetenland, he had no more interest in taking more territory in Europe. This was clearly a lie. Uh, 
uh, a really good example that I like, and I think this is a noble lie, is that both Henry Kissinger and Robert McNamara have said that when they were in positions of power, they said that they would use nuclear weapons to defend Germany if the Soviet Union attacked NATO and was overrunning Germany. And they later said that that was not true, that although they said they would use nuclear weapons to defend Germany, in fact, they would not have used nuclear weapons. When I was your age, we used to talk about the whole choice as to whether you would rather be red than dead or dead than red. And the argument that both McNamara and Kissinger were making was that in the event the Soviets were overrunning Western Europe, they'd rather be red than dead because the thought of using nuclear weapons and causing a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union was unthinkable. But in fact, what they did was they told the Soviets that they would use nuclear weapons. They told the Europeans they would use nuclear weapons. And why did they do that? Because for deterrence purposes, you want the Soviet Union to think that there's some reasonable chance that you'll use those weapons. Because if the Soviets think there's even only a 2% chance that you'll use those weapons, when you marry that 2% chance with the consequences, it makes you very reluctant to go to war. So for deterrence purposes, it made excellent sense to lie. But they were, in effect, telling a lie, as they later admitted. Uh, so interstate lies are one kind of lying. Another kind, which I'll talk much more about, is what I call fear-mongering. Fear-mongering is where leaders lie to their own publics. And basically, this is where leaders come to the conclusion that the public does not fully appreciate a particular threat. And therefore, they feel there is a need to inflate that threat, to make the threat look worse, so that you can motivate the people to spend money on defense, and even in some cases, go to war. Uh, in the American case, we have lots of instances of fear-mongering. I'll talk more about this. Uh, in the run-up to World War II, Franklin D. Roosevelt was trying desperately to get isolationist America into the war against Nazi Germany, and he engaged in fear-mongering. He lied in the fall of, it was actually the late summer of 1941 about the Greer incident. It was a naval incident at sea. Uh, and he lied for the purposes of trying to get the Americans into the war. Lyndon Johnson and Robert McNamara uh, engaged in fear-mongering in the summer of 1964 at the time of the famous Gulf of Tonkin incident for the purposes of getting Congress to give them what was effectively a blank check to wage war against North Vietnam. Uh, and as I'll talk about, and I've already talked about, the Bush administration told a handful of lies in the run-up to the Iraq war. This is fear-mongering. And the problem that the Bush administration faced, it's the same problem that the Johnson administration faced, it was the same problem that Roosevelt faced, was that the American people was, were not really enthusiastic about going to war against Saddam Hussein. They were not very enthusiastic about going to war against Vietnam, North Vietnam. LBJ, in fact, ran as a peace candidate in 1964. And isolationist America had very little interest in fighting a war against Nazi Germany. Given these circumstances, these various presidents engaged in fear-mongering. In all three cases, it involved uh, lying. So the first, kind of inter the first kind of international lying is interstate lying. That's where leaders lie to other countries. Second kind of international lying is where leaders lie to their own people for the purposes of threat inflation. Third kind of lie is a strategic cover-up. Uh, this is where leaders lie to cover up a particular policy or to cover up gross mistakes 
Uh, and they do it for strategic reasons. Remember the story I told you about the deal that President Kennedy cut on the Jupiter missiles. That was a strategic cover-up. Kennedy was lying in part to the American people to cover up the deal that he had cut with Khrushchev because he knew that if the American people found out what the deal was, the deal would fall apart and then we'd be back to square one. That's a cover-up. Uh, another example of a cover-up that's designed to disguise incompetence is uh, what happened in France in 1916. As many of you know, the Germans launched the very famous Verdun Offensive in February 1916 uh, against the French strong point. The French army at the time was commanded by General Joffre, and Joffre failed to make the necessary preparations to defend Verdun, and then his conduct of the battle uh, was uh, in many ways remarkably foolish. But there was no way that French leaders could tell the French public or tell the Germans that French troops were in the hands of an incompetent general. If you have an incompetent general, if anything, you have to go to great lengths to tell people that he's not incompetent, that the general who is in charge of determining whether your sons live or die almost has to be competent. And the last thing, again, you want to tell the Germans is that they're going up against French forces at Verdun that are led by an incompetent general, General Joffre. So what the French political leaders did was they described Joffre in positive terms when privately they thought that he was not very competent. Uh, another example of a strategic cover-up is that in 1969, the Japanese government decided to allow nuclear-armed American ships to enter Japanese ports. This was not a policy that would have sold well in, in Japan at all. So Japanese leaders lied when asked whether or not this agreement had been struck. Those are strategic cover-ups. Then we have nationalist myths, as you all know from studying nationalism. Nationalism is all about creating myths about your own past, where you portray yourself as the good guys and others as the bad guys. Uh, what would be a good example of a nationalist myth? Uh, after World War II, the Germans created the myth that the Wehrmacht had clean hands on the Eastern Front in World War II. By my calculations, the Germans murdered 22 million people in the East. 22 million people. These were not people who were killed in combat. They murdered 22 million people. Uh, and the myth was created after World War II that most of that murdering was done by the SS. Uh, and that the Wehrmacht had clean hands. Uh, we now know that that was not true, that the Wehrmacht was inextricably bound up in the German killing machine on the Eastern Front. Uh, but from a German point of view, you can understand why they wanted to create the impression that only a handful of people were involved. Another case of a nationalist myth is what the Israelis and their supporters in the United States have done to create the impression that the Palestinians left of their own volition in 1948 and they were not ethnically cleansed. Uh, we now know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Israelis ethnically cleansed the Palestinians uh, in 1948 and the story that the Palestinians left of their own volition so that the Arab armies could finish off the Jews and then allow the Palestinians to come back it was a myth that was created by Israel and its supporters to make Israelis, Israelis feel good about themselves and to sell Israel in the United States uh, in the late 40s and throughout the 1950s. Uh, but these are nationalist myths and I could point to many more uh, involving virtually every country in the world. And the final kind of international lies we have are what I call liberal lies. We have a well-developed body of liberal norms uh, that uh, 
mesh very well with just war theory. And these are well accepted uh, around the world and they're embellished in international law in many cases. But nevertheless, it's quite clear that uh, on occasion states go out and behave in barbaric fashion uh, and then try to disguise what they do by lying about it. Uh, just to give you a couple examples of this. By the way, the clean hands story would fit here as well. Uh, but uh, starting in the spring of 1942, the Royal Air Force began bombing German cities for the purpose of killing large numbers of German civilians, mainly German workers. It was area bombing. Uh, and it was done under the tutelage of Bomber Harris. The British lied consistently throughout the war about what they were doing because they did not want to admit that they were killing on purpose German civilians. During World War II, the United States went to enormous lengths to portray Joseph Stalin, who was a greater murderer than Adolf Hitler. If we were to rank the great murderers of the 20th century, Mao Zedong would be first, Joseph Stalin would be second, and Adolf Hitler would be third. But as you all know, we had to jump in bed with Joseph Stalin in World War II to fight against Nazi Germany. And to do that, we had to clean up Stalin and we had to tell the story that he was basically Uncle Joe and that he was a burgeoning, the Soviet Union was a burgeoning democracy and so forth and so on. But the biggest test of this strategy came in the spring of 1943 when the Wehrmacht discovered mass graves uh, in the Soviet Union of Polish officers who had been killed in the, in the Katyn forest uh, three years earlier in the spring of 1940. Uh, and the Germans made it quite clear, and we knew the Germans were correct, that the Soviets had murdered those Polish officers in the spring of 1940. But of course, you can imagine the conundrum that we faced, both us and the British, in the spring of 1943, when word began to leak out that uh, the Soviet Union had murdered huge numbers of Polish officers in the spring of 1940 we, mainly the British, lied about what happened and blamed it on the Wehrmacht, uh, not on the Soviets, who were our allies and who we were fighting against Nazi Germany with. So there are five kinds of international lies that states tell. Again, interstate lies, fear-mongering, strategic cover-ups, nationalist myths, and liberal lies. Now, what are the two main findings of my study? First of all, uh, I found that there is not much interstate lying. Uh, I'm not saying there's none. I want to be very clear on this, and I've given you some examples already. There is some interstate lying. This is where leaders lie to foreign audiences. But there is actually remarkably little. I was shocked by this finding, and almost everybody I have talked to who I tell that this is my finding, almost every one of those persons doesn't believe me. They say, that can't be. I'm actually amazed at how cynical most people are about this issue. They believe that there must be lots of interstate lying, but there is actually not much at all. Now, why did I expect there to be a lot of interstate lying? First of all, I'm a realist, and I believe that international politics is a nasty business and that states try to take advantage of each other for security-related reasons. So you would expect, given that worldview, that there would be lots of lying. No, I thought so. The other reason I thought there would be lots of lying is that in the United States, when you engage in economic deals to buy a house or to buy a car with someone else. In other words, if I'm going to buy a car from you, we are allowed to lie about what the economists call our reservation price. In other words, I can say I will not sell my house to you for less than $500,000, knowing full well that I'll go down to four ninety. But I tell you, the floor is five hundred. dollars Right. I can lie about my reservation price. You can lie about your reservation price. 
you can say, I won't pay more than $450,000 for your house, knowing full well that you'll go up to 480, right? And this happens all the time. I've sold cars and houses over the course of my lifetime where I have lied about my reservation price. And almost everybody else you talk to in the United States has engaged in the same practice. And I'm sure it's true here in Canada as well. Well, if that's true in the context of uh, daily life inside the United States, inside Canada, shouldn't we expect to see countries lying about their reservation price when they engage in arms control agreements? Shouldn't they say, we won't go under 1,000 missiles when they're willing to go down to 900 missiles? Shouldn't we see states engaged in economic negotiations lying about their reservation price as well? I think we should. So given my basic realist worldview, number one, and two, my experience with lying about reservation prices, I expected I would have no trouble finding lots of evidence of interstate lying. I found it very difficult to find examples. And when I would go around to audiences like this, people would come up to me afterwards or in the course of the seminar and say, there have to be lots of cases out there. You're just not looking hard enough. I would say to those people, please go home, come up with a laundry list, send it to me via email. I'd give them my business card. A week or two later, I'd get an email. They'd say, well, I could only come up with five cases. Here they are. And then when you looked at the five cases, three of them really didn't count as lying. They were cases of spinning or concealment. And there were, in reality, very few cases. Saddam Hussein, people would say, Saddam lied so many times. I'd say, please, give me one example of where Saddam lied. Nobody has yet been able to come up with an example of where Saddam lied. Am I saying that Saddam is a good guy? Right? No, he was a murderous thug. Was he deceitful in certain ways? Of course he was. But please, show me an example of where he lied. On and on. So the point is, I had difficulty coming up with the cases that I have. Now, question you want to ask yourself, and this is a very important question, is why is that the case? I believe there are two reasons for it. First of all, when you talk about high politics or areas where security is involved, national security is on the line, it doesn't really pay to lie because you can't get away with it. Because when the stakes are high, nobody really trusts you anyway. And to put it in Ronald Reagan's terminology, at that level, Trust, but verify. Verify is the key word. In the various SALT negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union, or arms control nego negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union, we never trusted each other, right? We had to be able to verify the agreements. So it's very hard at that level to get away with lying. Let's think about Adolf Hitler. How many leaders are really going to believe Adolf Hitler? in the 1930s, even before World War II starts. Not a lot of trust there. So it's just hard to get away with lying when high politics are at stake. But where you would expect to see a lot of lying, at least I did, was when low politics were involved. When economic negotiations, economic intercourse, uh, uh, negotiations over the environment, those sorts of things are at play. You would expect to see lying there. Why? because the stakes are not so high, and therefore states are likely to lower their guard, to let their guard down, because if they get lied to, the consequences are not so great. If you cut a deal on tariffs and somebody's cheating, the end result is not that big a deal. So you would expect to see lying down there. I actually find less evidence of lying in the realm of low politics than I do in high politics. Why do I think this is the case? <coughs> First of all, the benefits are just not very great, which of course is why states lower their guard when you're talking about low politics. The benefits are not very great, but much more importantly, it's the shadow of the future. 
when you're involved in economic negotiations, uh, it's usually not a one-time shot. You expect to be dealing with your uh, partner over a long period of time. And if you lie early on, it's going to poison the well and make it difficult to cut deals down the road. Uh, I've talked to Andrew Moravchik, who is probably, at this point, the world's leading authority on the European Union and has written this huge book that details how the European Union was created. And he told me that when he first started studying the European Union and the various deals that were put together to create it, he expected to find lots of evidence of lying, especially about reservation price, of course, which I expected to be the case as well. And he said he found virtually no evidence of lying. And this is consistent with my finding. And again, my explanation is, number one, the benefits are not very great. But you have to marry that to the fact that if you're caught lying, that makes it very difficult to negotiate subsequent deals, and you, in effect, end up screwing yourself. So there is little evidence of lying in the realm of low politics, as well as in the realm of high politics. So that was my first finding. My second major finding is that there is a considerable amount of lying by leaders to their own publics. And this is especially true with regard to fear-mongering. And as I pointed out to you before, you see lots of this in the American case. There's a book that Eric Alterman, who writes for The Nation, has written about presidential lying that I would recommend that those of you who are interested in this subject read. It's actually a very depressing book because it shows so much evidence of American presidents lying to the American people over time. Now, the question is, why would leaders lie to their public? Why would an American president lie to his public? And secondly, why do they get away with it, OK? Let me start first with explaining why they get away with it. The reason that leaders are able to lie to their publics much more effectively than they can lie to other states is because publics tend to trust their leaders. It's very hard to live in a country and to believe that your leaders are congenital liars. And when serious security issues, for example, are on the table, you expect your leaders to do the best by you and to be truthful with you. This may sound naive, but I think it really is an accurate description of how most people operate. And let me give you a personal example to highlight this. Somewhat embarrassing, but nevertheless true. Uh, I had listened in the run-up to the Iraq war, I'd listened to a lecture by Scott Ritter, the weapons inspector, the former weapons inspector, who made what I thought was a compelling case that Iraq had no WMD. And I started telling people that uh, that was the case. Uh, but then Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld said publicly that that was wrong. He said, we know that they have WMD, and we know that they have WMD because we know where they are. <laughs> of course, he didn't know where they are, right? No one knew where they were because they didn't have any, right? But he said, we know they have them because we know where they are. I said to myself, the Secretary of Defense is not going to make such a categorical statement if it isn't true. So Ritter must be wrong. Rumsfeld must be privy to information that Ritter is not privy to. And therefore, I stopped telling people that Iraq did not have WMD. And I changed my rhetoric to say that they probably do have WMD. And look at what Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld said. What was going on there? What was going on there was John trusted Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. He, he was our leader. He was one of our leaders. He was 
George Bush's right-hand man. I found it hard to believe, as cynical as I am as a realist, that he would lie to the American people. Right. But anyway, the point that I'm trying to make to you is that it's in situations where you have trust that the other side is able to lie. It's very difficult to lie in interstate politics, especially when security issues are on the table, because there's just not much trust. No one can afford to trust another leader. You cannot afford to trust. Adolf Hitler, Hitler can't afford to trust Stalin, he can't afford to trust Roosevelt, just the way politics works at the international level. But once you're inside a particular state, in most cases there is a remarkable amount of trust on the part of people towards the words of their leaders. And when their trust is there, that's what opens up all sorts of opportunities for lying. Now, Another reason that you get lying uh, to domestic audiences is the fact that leaders think they are doing the right thing. I want to be very clear about the Bush administration. I do not believe that President Bush or Secretary Rumsfeld or Vice President Cheney were lying when they told these various lies for selfish reasons. I think they were lying for reasons that they thought were in the American national interest. And they believed that once the war against Iraq happened, they would be proved correct. So they thought, in a very important way, they could get away with it because they were doing the right thing. Very important to understand that. They thought they were doing the right thing. These were strategic lies. Of course, that proved not to be the case. So the point that I'm making to you is that leaders get away with it and they lie because of all the trust, number one, and number two, because they think they will succeed. Now I want to talk a little bit about the American case. Uh, why is there so much lying in the American case? Right? Why does the American case more or less stand out? Uh, and it does stand out. And, and when I talk about lying here, I'm talking about fear-mongering. Remember, I'm on the subject of fear-mongering. I think that there are three reasons that you get lying to your public. Lying of the fear-mongering sort. One is lying is more likely in democracies than non-democracies. Because in a non-democracy, it's less important for a leader to have to explain what his or her policy is to the public. I'm not saying it's unimportant, it's just less important. In a democracy, a leader has to explain his or her policy. Second, if you're fighting preventive wars, you're likely to get lying. Because a preventive war is a war that's designed to deal with a distant threat. And the public in those cases is going to say, if it's a distant threat, let's wait, because maybe the threat will never manifest itself. It will go away. Right. So what happens in those cases is that leaders have to argue that it's an imminent threat. I'm sure many of you know this, but if you go back and look at the famous national security strategy of the Bush administration that was laid out in the fall of 2002, this is where the Bush doctrine was laid out, they don't talk about preventive war. They talk about preemptive war. Because preemptive war is acceptable according to just war theory, and it's acceptable according to international law. Preventive war is unacceptable, right? The reason they talked about preemptive war is because it's easy to sell a preemptive war. If they had used the word preventive war, which of course is what they were talking about against Iraq, they were talking about a preventive war. They could have never sold it. So what they had to do was create the impression that Saddam Hussein was an imminent threat. He was an imminent threat. If we didn't get him now, he was going to attack us. But of course, that wasn't true. So when you sell a preventive war, what you do is you try and sell it as a preemptive war, which it's not, which, needless to say, lends itself to lying. 
Uh, and then the third factor which encourages countries like the United States to lie is when you're fighting distant wars. The fact of the matter is the United States is the most secure great power in the history of the world. It's separated from all its principal adversaries by two giant moats. It has thousands of nuclear weapons and it has neighbors like Canada and Mexico which are not a serious threat to the United States. We are a remarkably secure country. It is very hard to get the American people exercised about fighting wars halfway around the globe. This is the problem that Roosevelt had with Nazi Germany. This, of course, is why the Bush administration had to promise the American people that Iraq was going to be a quick and easy victory. The United States, according to the Bush administration, was going to be able to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Go in, do the job, move out, go in, move in. You know the whole argument. Right? That's what the Bush Doctrine was all about. It was about democratizing the Middle East with military force and doing it quickly and easily in each case. Of course, it didn't turn out that way, but if they had told the American people we're going to be in Iraq for the next 25 years, the American people would say, think again, President Bush, we're not doing this. Right? Again, you're fighting wars at a great distance. So here you have the United States. It's a democracy likes to fight preventive wars. Think about Iran today. If we were to attack Iran in the next year, that would be a preventive war. Nobody is arguing that Iran has nuclear weapons or no one is seriously arguing that they're close to having nuclear weapons. The idea is to get them before they have nuclear weapons. That's preventive war. Furthermore, nobody's arguing that Iran is a direct threat to the United States. The argument would be that if Iran gets nuclear weapons, it's a threat to its neighbors, people who live in the region. Right? So to get the American people behind the military attack against Iran, as was the case with Iraq, as was the case with Vietnam, and really as was the case with Nazi Germany, right? President had to convince the American people this is a democracy, right? And the American president has to create the impression that this is an imminent threat. And in many of those cases, it was not. With Nazi Germany, it was. But that was not true with Vietnam, certainly not true with Iraq, and certainly not true with Iran. So the argument I would make is that you do not see much evidence of interstate line. And again, I'm not making the argument that there's no evidence of interstate line. You do not see much evidence of interstate line. You see more evidence of leaders lying to their own publics, especially engaging in fear mongering. And the clearest case of this is the United States of America. One, because it's a democracy. Two, it likes to fight preventive wars. And three, it is a remarkably secure country that's fighting wars at great distances. I will conclude by saying that given that the United States believes that it has a God-given right to run the world, given that American leaders believe that it is in our strategic interest and in the moral interests of everyone around the world, for us to police the globe, it is likely that we will continue to try to use military force in the years ahead to reorder the globe in our own image. And the end result of that is that we should expect more, not less, fear-mongering over time. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mersheimer, um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding the uh, theoretical framework of your research. Um, it seems to me that from what you've said that uh, lying as a tool of international politics um, is 
is instru instrumental and it should be predictive of certain political outcome. And, um, but on the other hand, lying itself is ultimately a discursive power, has this discursive power, meaning that, well, it's, it's relational, depends on who uses it, and it's also historical, historically contingent. Well, and that would mean that it shouldn't be prescriptive uh, without looking at the outcome after lion has been used. So isn't that a little contradictory to the realist assumption if it were to treat lion as a form of power, that would mean power is transhistoric and uh, it's structurally imposed by international anarchy. So I'm just a little curious, how would you resolve that conflict? Thank you. Uh, with regard to lying and power, uh, I'm a big believer that power is largely a function of material capabilities. I believe that your power is in large part a function of two things. One is the size of your population, and two, how much wealth you have. Uh, I mean, we can talk about military power in all sorts of ways that this economic uh, power manifests itself. But for me, power is about material capabilities. Lying is more like diplomacy. It's, it's a tool of statecraft. Uh, it doesn't have much to do with power. And I was not trying to make the argument that even the United States lies a lot because it's such a powerful country. You could point to some less powerful countries where there are a good number of examples of that country lying. So it's not related to power in any meaningful way. With regard to the whole subject of realism and how it fits with realism, uh, as I said to you before, I actually was surprised at how little lying there was in the international system because my realist inclinations sort of led me to believe beforehand that there would be lots of lying uh, when in fact it just didn't matter very much. Uh, I mean, there, was many, there weren't very many examples of it, and in the end, it, it didn't matter very much. And then just to marry the two points, as a realist, I've kind of long believed that all of the emphasis on concepts like surprise attack, clever diplomacy, lying, are greatly exaggerated. And in the end, what really matters is just how much raw power you have. And I think, if anything, doing this, uh, doing this uh, uh, study convinced me uh, that that was the case. Uh, what, what, what I did with this study, or what I learned from this study that sort of changed my thinking about uh, international relations, was I think that uh, I tended to underestimate before I began the study how important reputation is for low politics. Before I began the study, uh, my view was that reputation doesn't matter at all in international politics. It's just greatly exaggerated. But my thinking changed or evolved as I did this study on this whole issue of reputation. And I came to conclude that in the realm of high politics, I don't think reputation matters very much. I just don't think you can afford to pay much attention to reputation, because if you get fooled one time, the consequences could be catastrophic. But I think in terms of low politics, in terms of uh, economic intercourse and dealings of that sort, uh, because of the arguments I laid out about shadow of the future, I think reputation matters a lot more than I thought was the case before uh, I sat down and wrote this up. And uh, so I think if you read the book when it comes out carefully, you'll see me talking about reputation differently than when I started the book. <laughs>
thanks again for that. Uh, that was fabulous. Um, my question is on um, taking the assumption of line as a tool of statecraft, do you feel that with increased globalization and communication networking between civil society actors around the globe, that the relative efficacy of line as a tool of statecraft is diminishing. And what I would cite as an example or, or comparison would be the fact that uh, Kennedy's lie regarding the Cuban Missile Crisis and his negotiations with Khrushchev, as you said, took decades to come out and say, no, that wasn't actually true. And, and, and we removed the, uh, there was this, uh, the deal cut in, in uh, with missiles in Turkey, as opposed to the lies told uh, as an impetus for the Iraq war, which took less than a decade to come out and have the truth be, uh, uh, you know, circulated and, and findings found out. Uh, and, and would you, would you, uh, if, would you feel, uh, say that there is a decline in that efficacy? And if so, would you attribute it to, you know, globalization, global civil society, yeah. or to something else? Yeah, this is a great question. I've been asked this question probably about 10 times. Uh, I don't know uh, is my answer. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm being very honest with you. I'm not sure how to think about this one. It's one of those subjects I would have to sit down with some smart people about 10 different times just to sort of run through all the arguments, let them swish around in my brain, and then sort of come up with a, a, a conclusion. Uh, but a number of people I've talked to, very smart people like you, sense that, uh, sense that in the age of the internet, in the age of globalization, that the utility of lying has gone down because it's harder to get away with it. Uh, I don't think that's the case. But am I fully confident saying that to you? No, okay? So I think you ought to do a book on this. <laughs> but before you do, or at least a paper. Least a paper. I, I think it's a great question. But uh, uh, let me just make uh, some points uh, about your examples. Uh, first of all, uh, just on Iraq, your point is that, uh, uh, that uh, it took only a few years before we figured out that Bush and company were lying. But you want to remember that during the Vietnam War, it only took about three or four years before we figured out that Johnson was lying about the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, and this highlights the point that the key to uncovering a lie is to get people who are in that closed-knit circle I mean, to tell a lie, it, it can only involve a handful of people, and they have to keep their mouths shut, right? I, I think the Kennedy administration, if they were doing the Cuban Missile Crisis today in the age of globalization, would still get away with telling the lie. And they could keep it quiet for 20, 30, 40 years, in large part because the key is for the perpetrators of the lie to remain silent for as long as possible, right? And there's no way globalization or the internet gets inside of, of that cabal, that conspiracy. I don't mean those in negative words because I am talking about noble lies, right? But uh, I, don't, I, don't th I don't think it would have mattered for the Kennedy administration. Uh, and, and again, I think if you think about the Iraq example, what you say is true, but it's not that much different uh, in, in the Vietnam years. So that's why I'm kind of suspicious of the argument. The other thing that sort of cuts against what you said, and again, I'm not sure you're not right, uh, is that, as you know, there's a lot of misinformation on the internet as well as good information. And sometimes it's hard to figure out where the truth lies on a particular issue because there's just so much information swishing around. Hi, your last two comments sparked a, a question about method, and if you could speak more about how you unearthed lies, and I'm wondering, do lies become truth at some point, um, where people don't write a memoir that 
stipulates that they lied about something, and so no one ever knows that there that there was a lie. Particularly, your examples about um, reservation bids. Uh, if those are based on private information, is it possible that there are a lot of lies we just don't know about? Yeah, yeah. Excellent question. Questions, really. There's sort of two issues that you raise. One is where people are saying things that we might think are lies that really aren't lies because they believe them. If I'd had more time, uh, I would have talked at greater length about nationalist myths, okay? In most cases, people really believe those nationalist myths, in which case it's not a lie. In other words, if I say something to you that's false, but I believe that it's true, then it's not a lie. A lie is where I knowingly tell you something that I know is not true. If you say to me, John, did you have breakfast this morning? And I say, no, I did not have anything to eat this morning, didn't have any coffee, nothing. That would be a lie, okay? But to go back to my example of uh, the Israelis in 1948, right? The vast majority of Israelis and the vast majority of Israel's supporters in the United States believe that there was no ethnic cleansing in 1948, and they believe that the Palestinians left of their own volition. So when they perpetrate what I would call a myth, right, they're not telling a lie because they believe it's true. It's only those individuals who know what actually happened who perpetrate the myth who are engaged in lying. So when we talk about liberal lies, and nationalist myths. We have to be very careful for the reason that you raised, okay? The other issue is uh, the sort of methodological issue of how do you tell uh, when there was a lie, right? A, a lot of people say to me, John, there's actually been a lot of lying. You just haven't uncovered it. Right? Because the people who told the lies were very clever. Okay? Now, there's no question that if you go far enough back in history, we have virtually no records. Or the records that we do have are so spotty that you can't be confident that we didn't miss uh, some important lies that were told. But on the other hand, we do have a very rich historical record from the 19th and especially the 20th century on all sorts of important events. And you can look inside those particular cases and see whether there was lying or not. In some cases, there was lying. Khrushchev did lie about how many ICBMs he had in the 1950s. We can see that. We can see the American cases very well. Eric Alterman can write a book, indeed, on the matter because we have a rich historical record. But given that we have this rich historical record and a lot of cases we can look at, the question you have to ask yourself is whether or not it's possible that people are hiding lies inside those otherwise well-documented cases. And I think the answer is no, because if a lie was told, right, you would see, first of all, you'd see what the person said, and you'd see that it was a lie because the historical record is just so rich. And what you actually find is just not a lot of evidence of lying. And then when you talk to people who are involved, I've actually talked to a number of other people who've been involved in arms control negotiations and so forth and so on. Uh, almost everybody agrees that there's just not a lot of lying. And here's an expert on the subject uh, who was a distinguished diplomat for many years who basically agrees with me that diplomats don't lie very much. There's this very famous comment. What is it that diplomats are? An honest man sends abroad to lie for his country. Right. That's that. I have that. Right. That's that's a definition of an ambassador. And as I said to York last night, I think that that's just fundamentally wrong. And and he agrees with me. I mean, he has a selfish interest in agreeing with me, of course, but he's not an anomaly. Uh, but anyway, my point to you is, I I, I think. This is not a case of well-disguised lies uh, that people like me and other scholars just don't see. I just don't think there's much evidence of it because it's not there. Hi. Uh, I just have a quick, well, not that quick a question, but uh, I'm just wondering about 
the conditions under which uh, admission of guilt pertaining to lying uh, is um, subsequently uh, for, for, forgiven by, you know, by uh, uh, those who are lied to both in the domestic or international sphere. In, in the New York Times yesterday, there was a, a piece which was focusing uh, on Barack Obama's uh, admission that he was wrong, not that he lied, but that he was wrong to trust uh, that BP when they said that they were sufficiently prepared to you know, deal with any you know, math problems associated with uh, oil spills with offshore drilling. And what they, what they highlighted was the fact that you know, here's this president who's relatively early into his first term admitting uh, that he was wrong when, when you know, most of his predecessors fought tooth and nail to not do so. So, you know, if it's hard enough to admit you're wrong, it's fair to say that it's, it must be very difficult to admit that you lie. So are, are there instances or can you describe conditions under which leaders have successfully um, admitted that they lied and been forgiven for it? Uh, I think that uh, the price that a leader pays for lying depends on whether it's an interstate lie or whether it's a lie to his or her own domestic audience, okay? I think interstate lies, where a leader lies to another country, is hardly ever published, uh, punished. It's hardly ever punished. Because I think most people understand that leaders sometimes have to lie to other states for good strategic reasons. This is certainly true in wartime. So I cannot think of one example where a leader who lied and was revealed to have lied paid a price for it domestically, okay? And the one example that pops into my head because it was such a blatant example of lying was Dwight Eisenhower lying to the Soviets after the U-2 aircraft was shot down in 1960. Uh, before we got spy satellites up over the Soviet Union, the way we used to um, assess Soviet uh, military capabilities was by flying U-2 aircraft over the Soviet Union. And there was a famous incident right before a big summit meeting in 1960 where a U-2 that was piloted by Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union. And the CIA, which ran the operation, told Eisenhower that the aircraft had a self-destruct mechanism which guaranteed that not only would the U-2 be destroyed, but Powers would be killed as well. So Eisenhower felt that he was then in a position where he could deny uh, that this was a U-2 that was flying over the Soviet Union on a spy mission. Uh, anyway, if it had a self-destruct mechanism, it didn't work. The Soviets ended up not only capturing the U-2, but they captured Gary Powers alive. And Eisenhower did not know that. And he set off telling a series of lies. Uh, and uh, the Soviets then produced Gary Powers and the U-2. And it backfired. And it had all sorts of negative consequences. Uh, Eisenhower was a man who prided himself greatly on being honest. And he said in his memoirs that it was one of the darkest moments of his life uh, to have lied and been caught. And he was caught red-handed, right? Uh, and uh, so there's no question about that. But he paid virtually no political price here in the United States for having told that lie because the American people expected their president to do what was ever necessary, was that what, to do whatever was necessary to you know, gain advantage over the Soviet Union. It was just the way international politics is played. So I think if a leader lies to another country, there's very little uh, cost at home. Lying to your own people is a different matter, right? I believe that George Bush paid a serious political price for having lied to the American people in the run-up to the Iraq War. I believe that Lyndon Johnson paid a similar price once it became clear what had really happened in the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, 
in August of 1964. This is not to say that that's the only reason that George Bush or before that Lyndon Johnson got into trouble, but it hurt uh, him politically. And as Jorg was pointing out when we were walking over here this morning, with regard to uh, Barack Obama trying to sell the Iran threat, given what the Bush administration said about the Iraq threat, it's now very hard for any American president to convince the American people that there is a threat from Iran because we were lied to once and it was recent enough that most people remember it and most people are very reluctant to believe that the administration, even though it's a different administration, is telling the truth about Iran. So not only do leaders pay a political price, but in terms of how they deal with future threats, uh, they're somewhat handcuffed uh, or limited by the fact that they were caught that first time. Uh, I did not have enough time to talk about this, but if I had, uh, I was going to make the point that fear-mongering, when you lie to your own people, has potentially much greater cost than interstate lying. If you really think about what fear-mongering is all about, you're basically saying that your public is not capable of understanding the nature of the threat environment if you are truthful in describing it. In other words, President Roosevelt, President Johnson, and President Bush all felt that they could not get the American people to do what they thought was the right thing if they simply told the truth. They believed that they had to exaggerate the threat. They had to engage in fear-mongering. And the problem with that, this gets at what I was saying to you a few minutes ago, the problem with that is you're basically saying that your public is not very sophisticated. And it's not too big a step to go from lying to your public about international political issues to lying to your public about domestic political issues. Because in a very important way, you're making a judgment about the sophistication, about the ability of your public to make smart judgments. And I think the potential for really serious danger once you start to engage in fear-mongering is very great. Furthermore, just to take this a step further, and this is a very important point, if you engage in fear-mongering, I think there's a reasonable chance, if not a very good chance, that the policy that you're pushing is a wrong-headed policy. Because what you're saying is you can't sell that policy on rational legal grounds. You can't state the truth and convince people to buy the policy. You have to threat inflate. But that raises the possibility that maybe the reason that you can't convince the public to go along is because the public is right and you're wrong. Right? So the potential for backfiring, the potential that things will go south when you engage in fear-mongering is substantial. Witness what happened in Vietnam and witness what happened in Iraq. And I would be willing to bet if we did bomb Iran and we engaged in fear-mongering in the run-up to it, as you and I were discussing before, that one would backfire on us as well. So you see, when you engage in fear-mongering, there are two real problems. One is that it blows back into the domestic arena where the lying begins to spread into domestic political areas as well as international areas but also the possibility that you're pursuing a wrong-headed policy goes up substantially because, again, the reason you can't sell your policy might be because it's not a smart policy. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk today on such an intriguing subject. Uh, basically, my question is about distinguishing between domestic fear-mongering and interstate lies. Uh, it seems to me that any kind of domestic fear-mongering, for example, a, uh, a speech about the potential of a mushroom cloud, uh, if, we didn't if the United States didn't invade Iraq, uh, that's not only for domestic purposes, it, it 
influences uh, external opinion as well. Uh, so, is it is there a fine line? Isn't there a fine line between uh, domestic fear mongering and kind of more, a more international line? Uh, and secondly, just quickly, uh, as those of us that are trying to analyze international politics, kind of as it happens, uh, other than distrusting our national leaders, is there any way that we can uh, figure out what? Yeah, there you go. What what was the last question again? Is just about. Uh, Uh, there is no question that lies of one sort can also be lies of a different sort. Remember I talked about five different kinds of lies and uh, what you were getting at is that one particular lie can also fit in another category as well. Uh, Remember, I talked about the case of the Wehrmacht and the whole matter of whether it had clean hands on the Eastern Front between 1939 and 1945. And I, when I first described it, I called it a nationalist lie. And I also said that it could be categorized as a liberal lie. From the American perspective, it was a liberal lie. We bought the lie because we wanted to clean the Germans up after World War II. So we could resurrect them and use German scientists like Werner von Braun in the United States and so forth and so on. So that is a good case. The Jupiter missiles, remember I made it clear that President Kennedy uh, had to sell the Cuban, had to sell uh, the deal to the American people and he had to sell it to the Europeans, especially the Turks. So there's the American people, the domestic audience, uh, and, and the international audience. Case you bring up the case of Iraq, I think Bush was mainly concerned about inflating the threat for the purposes of convincing the American public to go along with him. But I think there's no doubt, apropos your point, that Bush was also trying to send a message to the Europeans more generally, right, that Iraq was a dangerous threat and that they should support what the United States intended to do. So there you have two audiences. I just think in that case, the main audience was the American audience. But there's no question that I could point to all sorts of other examples uh, of cases that uh, uh, cross uh, cross the boundary between categories, or the, the boundaries between categories. Uh, with regard to your final point about how we as scholars should think about dealing with, uh, uh, with policy makers, this is a huge issue, and I could talk for hours on it, but I'll just say a few words. Uh, I do believe that it is very important in a democracy, and by the way, very important in non-democracies as well, uh, to create independent power centers that uh, are filled with people who are protected and who can challenge authority. Uh, I believe that human beings uh, are limited in their reasoning capacities and even the smartest people in any country <coughs> at best get it right 75% of the time and are wrong the other 25% of the time. I believe that it's possible for any country to pursue for what they, for what the leaders think are good reasons, foolish policies, right? There's no country that's ever existed that always pursued a smart foreign policy. Countries often pursue foolish policies. So what you want to do, in my opinion, is you want to have independent institutions that can criticize power. Yes, that's exactly right. You want, you want independent institutions. 
And, and by the way, one of the reasons that you have tenure at universities is to protect professors who say controversial things. Right? The reason that we put such great <laughs> emphasis on freedom of the press is because you want a situation where people can criticize powerful figures, can criticize the government, and not be punished for criticizing the government. So my view is that as a scholar, what you want to do over the years is you want to make sure you don't compromise yourself by getting too close to power. I am very suspicious of people who consult for large sums of money. Uh, I believe I have lots of friends who consult and make lots of money and they, they can tell you a story about how it hasn't corrupted them at all and they still speak truth to power and so forth and so on. I don't believe it for one second, right? And this is not like they decide, oh, uh, I'm going to, you know, consult for $500,000 a year for uh, this oil company, and uh, but I'll still, uh, they, they don't say I'll, I'll consult for $500,000 a year, but I just have to face the fact that I'm not going to be able to speak the truth like I used to. That's not the story they tell themselves. They tell themselves a story about how they'll still be honest and so forth and so on, and they convince themselves of it. It gets back to your question, right? They're, they're, they, it, it's self-deception is what it is. It's self-deception. It's not lying. Right. And, but anyway, back to my story, I think it's very important for you and for me and for people who are in our business not to get too close to power and not become dependent on money. And by the way, this is what's happened to the American media, right? The American media uh, is now sort of in bed with the power elite in Washington and you can't count on the American uh, mainstream media to tell you much of anything that's worth anything. Right, but so that's point one. But point two is it's very important for you to be controversial. That is your job, right? You are supposed to seek out contentious issues, big and important issues, and you are supposed to make arguments that are at odds with the conventional wisdom. What would be the purpose, just think about it, what would be the purpose of focusing on small and narrow and unimportant questions? Would anybody want to do that for the rest of their life? Of course not. You should be looking for big and important questions. You should be looking for questions that matter where you can say something that is new and indeed controversial. And you don't want to be controversial for the sake of being controversial. That's not my point. My point is that it's very important to have institutions like CIGI, like the University of Chicago, right, where people are protected and people have a home and people can weigh in in sophisticated and smart ways on important policy issues. If you work for the government, Right. whether it's the Canadian government, the American government, or any other government, there are limited, there are real limits on what you could say about particular issues because the government puts down boundaries. And what you want in a democracy, and even in a non-democracy, is to create institutions where people can operate outside of those boundaries. And if they don't like what you have to say, tough luck. And that's all for the good. As I was saying before, the more I go along, the more I think the founding fathers in the United States really understood right, how important it was to have checks and balances, to have institutions where people could criticize the government, because what they understood is that in individual leaders, even with the best of intentions, sometimes screw up big time. Right? And the best way to minimize the chances that that will happen is to have something approximating a marketplace of ideas where people can get out and state controversial views. And we debate these views. Just to turn to this whole subject of the Israel lobby, right, that Steve Walton and I wrote a book on. In the United States of America, and I think it's even worse here in Canada, right, it's almost impossible to have a critical discussion about Israel and in the American case, the U.S. relationship with Israel. This is not good for the United States, and it's not good for Israel. It just is not. 
It's much better if you could have an open discussion about these matters, where you can get all the issues out on the table and both sides can weigh in. What is the purpose of preventing discussion, critical discussion, about Israeli policy? Israel, as I like to say, is a normal country. It's a normal country. It sometimes pursues smart policies, and it sometimes pursues foolish policies. Just like Canada, just like the United States, just like every other country that's ever existed on the face of the earth and ever will exist on the face of the earth. So when it pursues foolish policies, should we be in a position where we can't say anything about it? And indeed, in the United States, you have to praise Israel even when it's pursuing a foolish policy. The Lebanon War of 2006 was a remarkably foolish policy on the part of Israel. The Winograd Commission has now uh, determined that to be the case. Most American strategists understood that at the time, but yet you couldn't say that because you're not allowed to criticize Israel in the United States or in Canada for that matter, or if you do, you're gonna pay an awful price. This is a healthy situation? Heck no, it's a foolish situation. It would have been much better if we could have had an honest debate at the time. It would have been better for Israel. If Israel is pursuing a smart policy, it should be able to win in the marketplace of ideas. And if it's not, then it should get criticized. And I'm not picking on Israel here, because again, my point is Israel is a normal country. It's like the United States. You want to have a marketplace of ideas. And by the way, in the run-up to the Iraq war, it was very hard to have an honest discussion in the United States about what we were about to do. Because anybody who was against the war was described as an appeaser, a moron, or what have you. This is not healthy. You want to have good debates. So my view is, people like you who are getting advanced degrees, many of whom will operate in various institutions of higher learning or think tanks or research centers, you want to be Bolsheviks. You want to challenge authority. To put it in Hans Morgenthau's terms, you want to speak truth to power. That is a healthy thing. Because again, as the Founding Fathers recognized, and most of us recognized, we are all fallible human beings. There are real limits to our reasoning capacities. Sorry for the lecture. Okay, <laughs> well, Dr. Mearsheimer, thank you so much for coming to Waterloo and for giving us that talk. Um, I actually happen to see a lot of parallels between international relations theory and parenting. And, uh, uh, and when it comes to raising my two kids, uh, I am actually a realist as well, and I believe that it is all about power. And as you were going through your talk, I got thinking, well, my wife and I have engaged in interstate lying, we've engaged in fear-mongering, strategic cover-up, national myths about our past, uh, and liberal lies, which we believe are, in fact, noble lies when it comes to raising our kids. And so, if nothing else, you've given me a new sympathy for Donald Rumsfeld. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but in all seriousness, um, it's so important, uh, particularly at institutions like CG and the Bolsley School, that we really strive to understand state behavior and scratch beneath the surface. And you've given us a new analytical tool for, for doing that uh, as we grapple with big questions. And I assure you, all of our students are grappling with big questions. Um, so on behalf, again, of the group, thank you very much. Um, before we uh, end the session, uh, as Dr. Heine mentioned, this is our final uh, lecture in the International Governance Speaker Series. And uh, there are a number of people who deserve tremendous thanks uh, for all of the work that they've done this year. This, a lot of work does go into putting this, this series together, which is, of course, the flagship series in our program. It's the, the one time each month when we all get together, uh, we have lunch, we socialize, we, uh, we share ideas. And this would not be possible without certain people and institutions. So I'd like to thank Joe Turcott and Alison Yankee at the back. They've been uh, the behind the scenes people. Uh, for all of this. Uh, I would also like to thank the Center for International Governance Innovation. Uh, as many of you know, they sponsor, CG sponsors, this series, and we would not be able to bring 
the quality of speakers that we have been able to bring in without CG's very, very generous support. And so uh, on behalf of the program, I'd like to, to thank CG. And finally, I'd like to thank Dr. Jorge Heine. Uh, the, for the last two years, Dr. Heine has been uh, organizing and coordinating this series. And uh, I think everyone would agree that the, uh, the caliber of speakers that have come to Waterloo, thanks to Dr. Heine, has been absolutely first rate and exceptional. And uh, when I talk to prospective students about our programs, the International Government Speaker Series is the first thing I mention. So uh, on behalf of the school, I'd like to uh, extend my thanks to Dr. Heine. I'll pull back, pull out that memo from my files and talk about international lying, which is what I decided to do. And then I subsequently gave more talks, uh, talked to more people, wrote a paper, and then eventually the book that's coming out this fall. And that's what I want to tell you about today. Let me start by telling you that the key premise in my study is that lying sometimes makes good strategic sense. My argument is that lying is a useful tool of statecraft. It has political utility. Now, when I talk about lying, I'm not talking about selfish lies where people lie for their own personal benefit. I'm talking about what I would call strategic lies. This is where people lie because they think it is in the national interest. In effect, people are telling lies that they believe are noble lies, to use Plato's famous phrase. And just to give you an example of how this might work. Uh, for purposes of settling the Cuban Missile Crisis, Nikita Khrushchev told President Kennedy uh, that he would pull the Soviet missiles out of Cuba, provided that Kennedy pulled the Jupiter missiles out of Turkey. We had nuclear-armed Jupiter missiles in Turkey. Now, Kennedy had actually wanted to get rid of those Jupiter missiles before the Cuban Missile Crisis. So he had no problem getting rid of those missiles. But he understood full well that the political costs, both at home and in Europe, especially with the Turks, would be very great if he was seen as having agreed to bring the Jupiter's home in return for the Soviets bringing the missiles in Cuba home. He just couldn't cut that deal in public. So he told Castro, excuse me, he told uh, Khrushchev that um, he'd accept the deal, but Khrushchev could not tell anyone in a public forum about the deal. And if he did, Kennedy would deny it. Kennedy, of course, also understood that uh, people in the United States would smell that deal and ask questions about it. And of course they did. And what Kennedy then did was he lied. And we didn't know if when leaders say a number of truthful things for the purpose of leading someone to a false conclusion. In other words, they hint at this false conclusion. They don't explicitly lie the way they do in the first sense. Let me give you an example of this. Many Americans believed before the war against Iraq, and certainly after the war against Iraq, that Saddam was involved in the events of 9-11. This is the idea that Saddam helped contribute to what happened on September 11th. Now, the Bush administration never said explicitly that Saddam was responsible for 9-11. But I could give you a list of probably about 20 comments by the president, the vice president, and some of their lieutenants where they clearly hinted that Saddam was responsible in part for the events of 9-11. And of course, as you all know, this was very important in getting the American people to back the war against Iraq. So this is a case where leaders are not explicitly saying that something is true when it's not. 
This is where they're making a number of elliptical statements, right? Not explicit lies that are designed to give people a false impression of what actually happened. That to me is a second form of lying. Now, what are the other forms of deception that exist besides lying? It's important to understand that deception can take three forms. First kind is lying. The second is concealment. Concealment is where leaders simply say nothing about a particular issue. Good example, again, having to do with Iraq. In the run-up to the war, the Bush administration concealed from the American people the fact that we had had two instances where prominent, al excuse me, prominent Al-Qaeda leaders, Sheikh, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Abu Zubaydah, told us Good afternoon. Let me welcome you to this, the closing session of our monthly international governance lecture series for this academic year. I'm a great believer in starting things on the right note and in ending them with a bang rather than with a whimper. So I'm thus particularly delighted that this academic year we're closing this series with such a noted international relations theorist as we have today. By definition, in a PhD program in global governance, we sometimes show a certain institutionalist bias. But I think it would be fair to say that we are of a pluralist persuasion, and we are keen to be exposed to as many distinguished voices from the international relations field as possible. We are extremely fortunate to have with us today to close our program for this year, none other than Professor John Mersheimer, the Wendell Harrison Distinguished Prof Service Professor at the University of Chicago and the co-director of the Program on International Security Policy there, and one of the most established representatives of the realist school of thought in international relations. Professor Mayor Simon brings to his analysis of international affairs a very special perspective as a West Point graduate and as someone who served uh, both in the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force. He knows only too well the realities of hard power and the imperatives of war, as some of you discovered in our over lunch discussion. Um, a frequent contributor to the leading journals in international security, international security, Professor Mejam is the author of five books, including Conventional Deterrence and The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, books which have won a number of awards. He is best known, though, for his book co-authored with Stephen Walt, The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy a book that made the New York Times bestseller list and has been translated into 19 languages. It is thus not just intellectual rigor and a fierce commitment to the full understanding of what happens in international politics that characterizes Professor Mayor Simon's work, but also an unwillingness to stay away from highly controversial topics, veritable academic minefields where not many political scientists dare to thread. The latest subject he has taken on, and on which he has kindly shared with us a preliminary version of a few chapters of his forthcoming For many decades, the, the deal had actually been cut, because the Kennedy administration, including President Kennedy himself, denied at point after point that there had been any deal on the Jupiter missiles, when in fact, of course, there had been a deal. This, in my opinion, was a noble lie. Kennedy was, in my opinion, smart to lie because it was very important to end the Cuban Missile Crisis and make sure we didn't end up in a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. As I go along here, I'll point out some other examples that I think are noble lies. But the point that I'm making to you here is that when leaders tell lies, right, although it is sometimes for selfish purposes, those are not the cases I'm interested in. I'm interested in the cases where leaders tell lies for what they think are good strategic reasons. They think that lying is in the national interest. Now, very important to define what I mean by lying. 
because you can have a rather loose definition of line or you can have a rather tight definition of line. And depending on which one you choose, that affects how you think about this tool of statecraft. I have a rather tight definition. For me, line is where a leader says something that he or she knows is not true. Um, a good example of this is when Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld said on September 27th, 2002, this is roughly six months before we launched the war against Saddam, which was of course in March 2003. He says on September 27th, 2002, we have quote unquote, bulletproof evidence of a link between Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. Of course, he did not have bulletproof evidence. And he said on October 4th, 2004, before the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City, to my knowledge, this is Rumsfeld speaking, to my knowledge, I have not seen any strong, hard evidence that links the two. Remember, he had said, we have bulletproof evidence. And here he is, a few years later, saying he had not seen any such evidence. That's one kind of lie. Lying also occurs, book to be published by Oxford University Press, is provocatively entitled, Why Leaders Lie, Lying in International Politics. This is, you might say, not exactly a conventional subject to find in IR syllabi, yet one that is rather important. With so much strategizing and positioning for advantage that takes place in foreign policy and in diplomacy, the question of lying, how much of it takes place, what role it plays in negotiations and so on is obviously very significant. Yet until now, it has not been taken on as directly and as straightforwardly as Professor Meyersheimer has. I, for one, have therefore great curiosity as to what his findings on this subject have been. Without further ado, I leave with you Professor Mersheimer. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here at CIGI. And I'd like to thank Jörg very much for inviting me to speak and for all of you to coming out and to listen to what I have to say. As you know, I wrote this book uh, on why leaders lie. And I thought I'd start by telling you how I got interested in the subject. I got a phone call in the spring of 2003 from a man named Serge Schmeyman, who then wrote for the New York Times. And he said that he was writing a piece for the Week in Review section on lying in international politics. And he said, for some reason, my name popped into his head, and he decided to call me. Now, I had never spoken to him before, uh, and I, I knew his name, but I didn't know him. So he started by saying, what do you know about lying in international politics? And I thought for a second, and I said, I've never thought about the subject. And I said, as I'm racing through my brain here, I can't think of anything that's been written on the subject. So I said, why don't you tell me what you're thinking about the subject, and then I'll uh, react to what you have to say. So we talked for about an hour, had a very fruitful conversation, and then I wrote a memo for the record afterwards. Uh, then a few months later, I got a call from MIT, and they asked me if I would come and give a talk. And I said, of course. Uh, and I said, what do you want me to talk about? And they said, anything you want. So I said, well, maybe.